Financial markets and hockey, two topics that I bet you wouldn't think would work together on one show. Well, we're not 100% sure either, but we're going to give it a shot. We are going to tackle market volatility, inflation, you name it, and we're going to dive straight into the race to the Stanley Cup Finals. Plus, there may be some Islanders tickets for a few lucky fans. All that coming up in the next hour, live on Advice on Ice. Hey, thanks everybody for joining us for what we expect will be a robust discussion on two topics that we know our viewers are passionate about right now, the markets and hockey. And we are, as many of you know, into the second round of the Stanley Cup playoffs. Lots to talk about there. We have a great panel of guests here with me today, Bill Carroll, Neil Smith, David Lefkowitz, and of course, any hockey fan out there knows Neil and your pedigree with the 94 Rangers, New York Rangers, of course, winning the cup. We're going to get into all of that with all of you. And David, I've got a million market questions for you. But Bill, I really want to start with you. I, and I, really, I have to read this off. And I've, I've known you for a very long time. We've been working together for a long time. 37 years in the industry. You've been an FA. You've been a regional director, a national sales manager, head of the investment platform. And now your current role is the Eastern Divisional Director. Um, and you see, oversee one-third of the wealth management business for UBS. So it's 61 offices, 1,800 financial advisors who pr serve over a million clients. So here's the question. In those 37 years, now you've seen a lot of things, the 87 crash, the 09, 08, you know, great recession. Um, you've seen you know, the tech wreck of 99 and the rebound to the market where we've seen today. Now you've seen COVID. We've all seen COVID. What did you learn from all these things and how could that maybe give us a sense of you making sense of what's happening right now? Well, first of all, Anthony, thank you for making me feel very old. <laughs> Number one. I did that on purpose for <laughs> you, you, of did. course. You know. Great to be doing this with you. Great <laughs> to be doing it with two good friends, Neil and David. And I really have to thank our clients and our guests who are joining us tonight. I appreciate their time. Most of all, the trust and confidence they place in their UBS advisor. You know, I can't miss an opportunity, Anthony, to also recognize and thank the 1,800 plus advisors in my Eastern Division. They work really hard every day to provide perspective on the issues of the day, guided by our global CIO. And David, thank you, you're a key part of that. And you'll hear from David shortly. Most importantly, the advice they provide to their clients. So as you said, yes, Anthony, remind everyone, 37 years. Did I say that out loud? I, I think Sorry you did. about that, Bill. But I have to tell you, it was quite a challenge <laughs> to start in the industry at 12 years old, but I managed to do that. <laughs> now everybody's doing the math. So. No, that's it. They can add it up now. <laughs> the events you described, however, make a 12-year-old grow up really quickly. That's for sure. But to answer your question seriously, there are certainly a lot of lessons that come out of experiencing all the things you described. The Dow Jones, I hope you're all ready for this was 1,315, yes, 1,315, the day I started in this industry. Jeez. And David, I don't know, what a close today, around 31,000 something, at, off a high of 37,000. Yet in between those numbers, you described several things that at the time they occurred, you would think the market would never recover or ever go higher again. I clearly remember so many clients and even colleagues I worked with saying, that's it. I'm done, it's never coming back, mm -hmm. I'm out. So I've learned you have to remove the emotion from making investment decisions and that whatever feels like the hardest thing to do at the moment, it's usually the right thing to do. And no one should have money invested in the markets if they don't have at least a five year time horizon. You know, history tells us the vast majority of time you will do well if you stay in. Great stat for you. David, you have to hold me tr true on this one. I think it is true. I read it on the S&P website. <laughs> <laughs> There's got to be truth uh, on it's there. It's got to be right. true. Right. It's not fake news. <laughs> if you go back to 1930, if an investor missed the S&P 500's 10 best days, the total return stands at 28%. Not terrible, 28%. If, on the other hand, the investor hung in there, stayed invested the entire time, the return goes to 17,715%. What's, what's the moral of the story, boys and girls? Stay invested. That's right. So I'm going to summarize with three quick things to your question. It's time in the market and not timing, which even the best of people can't do. Mm -hmm. 
Don't make emotional decisions. Make practical decisions based on facts and the advice of a trusted professional. And the third one is one I learned the hard way. Have a sell discipline. We're all good at buying a stock. Oh, I love that company. I'm going to buy that stock. But the vast majority of investors have no idea, no plan, no strategy when they're going to sell it. Use price targets on the upside and the downside and stick to them. It's a discipline that removes the emotion. Right. Yeah. And Bill, you know, interestingly, when you were talking about the whole I'm um, getting out all through those, I remember and I've been in the business for a little less than you, about 25 years, 24 years, the tech debacle in 99, the 08 or not, everybody's like, that's it. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. But as you just said, stay in it because there's so much opportunity. And we all thought right at the beginning of COVID, I think this was going to be the, the, the disaster and it turned out to be quite a different story. And now, David, I know we're going to get into that, but Bill, I want to ask you because you talk to your advisors all the time, advisors all across the country, not even just the ones in your division, but what are they hearing from their clients? Because there is so much volatility right now. And there's so much uncertainty that's in front of us with all the things going on in the world politically and you know, with the wars in Ukraine and the inflation, and there's just a lot. What are they hearing from their clients, these FAs? Great question. I have to tell you, Anthony, one of the great privileges of my role is I get to meet with so many of our clients, and obviously, I talk with FAs every day. Um, my friend Neil and I have been at the arena a lot this year. We've met with clients. David and I have been in private briefing meetings together. I'd say the most common thing I'm hearing from advisors is how they're focusing on constant communication during this period, keeping their clients focused on their financial plan, which is so important. I'll talk more about that later. Mm -hmm. And their need to have continuous access to our intellectual capital. Clients really need that as well as our FAs. And the CIO office, which of course David is one of the lead people and does an amazing job. FAs are asking for something that clients want as well. Continued ideas that allow them to take advantage of the opportunities during this volatility. And very often that means things like non-correlated investments, hedged ideas that aren't necessarily trading in the public markets. Um, investment ideas like, and I'll just name a few quickly, private equity, distressed debt for the right kind of client, uh, structured products which protect on the downside. In my conversations and meeting with clients, there's a lot of focus on what does UBS think? Again, our wonderful CIO office, and maybe just as importantly, what do I do about it? Mm -hmm. And they also want to know, clients certainly want to know, what are other people like me doing, people in similar situations? That is one of the greatest advantages of our firm with a 150-year history of providing wealth management advice. You know, it's apparent in talking with clients, they went through what I would call three stages recently since this market started declining. And it coincides closely, and David will get into this with the start of the European war crisis, the, the Fed moves, inflation kind of spiking up. The first sentiment that I experienced in my conversations at that time with clients was, okay, the markets are dipping. The last 10 years, what have I learned? Every time the markets dip, what do I buy? Where's the opportunity? I'm going to miss out if I don't do it. The next was, wow, this thing's kind of going on here. Do I get out? And I think it sort of worked its way to the third stage where we are now, which is I'm not sure I'm ready to commit more capital to this market, but I'm also not getting out and running for the hills. I can say this with absolute certainty from almost every client meeting I'm in. Clients want a reason to get back in. They believe in the long-term prospects of the market. They believe in the long-term prospects of this country and our ability to grow, as we always have. It's just a matter of when is that catalyst going to happen that's going to drive them in that direction. Right. And, and it brings us right to the talk of the markets, David. So let me, let me ask you, because the word volatility gets thrown around, uh, especially around here, quite a lot. But it, it, it's really, it, it bears repeating because that's what we're, even just looking at the markets the way they were today, we started, uh, you know, the Dow and the S&P and the NASDAQ were right at their, almost right at their lows in the morning and they fluctuated and they closed almost uh, at break-even levels. I think the NASDAQ even closed a little positive here today. Um, what's, what would you say is the main factor for the volatility? Because there is so much going on out there. Right. I mean, I think Bill touched on so, on some of these things. I, I think it's part of the issue has been it's been a number of factors, right? We have we have a we have a land war in Europe, we've got COVID still with us in China, right? So we've got we've got geopolitical issues, and then we've got inflation, uh, which is which is a big issue, uh, and then at the same time we've got uh, the Fed that is embarking on its most aggressive tightening cycle 
you know, probably since at least 1994. They're, they're raising interest rates at the most aggressive pace that we've seen in, in decades. And then compounding all of that, that's leading to concerns that all of this Fed rate hikes, all these Fed rate hikes are eventually going to have some impact on the economy and potentially tip us into recession. So it's been this kind of stew of issues. Uh, we've had a lot thrown at us this year, geopolitical issues, inflation, growth concerns, and, 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 and the Fed raising interest rates on top of all that. So it, it's been a lot for, for markets to absorb, and that, that explains why they've been so volatile. Right. I mean, the Fed is super hawkish right now. I mean, they, there's, they're, we're expecting Jay Powell kind of indicated 50 basis points in June and July, um, mm -hmm. although he did stop in, you know, as, as much as saying we wouldn't really go 75. But there's been a lot of questions about right. are they now being too hawkish, which we'll get into a minute, into mm -hmm. a minute in a minute with you. <laughs> but with this volatility, do you think that this is – going to continue? How much, it's, I know that you don't have a sure. crystal ball, right, right. but what are your, what does your expert opinion show you and what are the stats yeah. showing you? So look, of all the things I talked about, I think the most important is inflation, right? I mean, what, what's going on right now is the, the Fed is really trying to get their arms around inflation. It, it's a, it's a big problem. And what they're trying to take action to reduce that level of inflation. So that's going to be the primary variable that determines whether or not the, this mar these markets go up or it will go down. And what I mean by that is if, the, if inflation starts to come down, which we think it will, uh, that it'll, it, we think we've seen the peak of inflation, then, then that takes the pressure off the Fed and they don't have to keep on raising interest rates. And I, you, know, you were talking about a catalyst bill. I think that's going to that's gonna be one of the key catalysts. If we get to later this year and the Fed says, look, inflation's moving in the right direction, and we've done a lot in terms of raising interest rates. And they say, they get to the point where they're saying, yeah, maybe we can start pausing and, and, and see how the economy uh, handles the, the interest rates that we've already uh, raised. Then, then I think there'll be a, a huge relief rally when that happens. Now, I just want to make also clear our perspective is that, you know, I, I think the big market debate is recession or what everyone's saying, a soft landing, right? Mm -hmm. and, and even Jay Powell talks about a soft landing. You know, our view is that it, we will have a soft landing in the economy, that, there, that consumers are in good shape, jobs are still very plentiful. In fact, there's, there's two jobs uh, available for every unemployed person out there. Consumers are sitting on a lot of cash. So there's a lot of dry powder for, for the economy to withstand some of these headwinds. Uh, but we have to acknowledge that there are risks. There's risks that the Fed is going to be forced to raise rates too much. Uh, and eventually tip us into recession. That's not our base case because we do think that inflation will come down. But I don't think the markets are going to have confidence on that outcome. It's going to take some time. And I think so for that reason, I think it's, we're going to still be in this sort of choppy environment. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's, it, but I think later this year, towards the end of the year, we'll get a little bit more clarity about how high the Fed's going to go and what's happening with inflation. Right. And, you know, you use the word confidence. It's, I mean, as a consumer, we're all consumers as well. It's hard to have confidence as a consumer when you go to the gas station and you're putting gas in your car and it costs more, way more than it did just a few days before that. And we were talking about this, Neil, diesel, and we were, you know, six dollars a gallon or so in some places when, you know, historically diesel was always a lot cheaper than regular, you know, unleaded. So it's, it's hard, I would imagine, for the average consumer who's paying a lot more for the everyday goods that they've been, you know, accustomed to using for many years at these levels. So that's where I think when you think about are we in fear of inflation never really ending, I think the average person says, oh, it feels like it never will. But I'm glad you're saying that, you know, when you look at the, you know, what, what's really going on out there and what the Fed's mandate is, that we shouldn't really see a prolonged inflation rise for many more months to come. Yeah, look, I, I would break inflation into three buckets. So I think there's the commodity inflation, which we've absorbed a lot already. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, the, the war was unexpected, and that certainly drove up commodity prices across the board. But the markets now understand that, right? So I, I don't think we're going to see another shock coming in the commodity side. Uh, the other, and so that should get better. The other aspect is supply chains, right? And really, I, you know, people talk about supply chains, but in reality, we, we saw a surge in consumption for goods. Mm -hmm. Surge, you know, everybody during the pandemic, what were people doing? Buying new standing desks, buying a second monitor at home, mm -hmm. moving out of cities, moving into 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 larger houses, well, buying more furniture. Buying a treadmill you never use. <laughs> buying a, a Peloton you don't use. That's right, guess, nodding right? their heads right, <laughs> right. now. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> we, we saw this surge in demand for goods. Mm -hmm. And look, the, the global economy just wasn't able to really handle it. Now what we're starting to see, and that leads to shortages, it leads to inflation. What we're starting to see is the, the demand for goods is beginning to level off. People are getting out again. They're going on vacation. They're yes. going, going out to restaurants. So the supply chain issues should start to get better, assuming COVID doesn't wreak havoc further. And then, and then the last piece of inflation is, is wages. And this is what the Fed is most worried about because wages, wage prices, ha wage uh, inflation has been, has been very high. Mm -hmm. And the Fed, that's the sticky kind of inflation that can linger and lead to these wage price spirals that sort of an echo of what we had in the 70s. The Fed really wants to try to get that under control. And uh, you know, the good news is that there still sh are some people on the sidelines who haven't come back into the workforce. They can do that. They can s help loosen up the labor market a little bit. But that's going to be the key thing to watch. Great. Thanks, David. Uh, I just want to let our viewers know we are happy to take questions for you. It's a live show. Uh, anything can happen in the next 45 <laughs> minutes. So um, if you'd like to send us an email, it's easy enough. The address is UBS uh, Studios at UBS.com. It's right there on the screen, UBS Studios at UBS.com. There's also, if you're watching the webcast on the website, which you must be to be able to watch this, there's an ask a question button. Same thing, it goes to the same inbox. So we'd love to hear from you, whether it's about the markets or about hockey, which we're gonna get to in a little bit. Before we do that though, Bill, I have to ask you, I'm gonna role play with you a little bit. Um, as an FA, if you're, if you're sitting there as an advisor, what resources would you share with your clients? Uh, and clearly, there are many coming out of our firm. We have a ton of some of the best intellectual capital on the street. What resources would you be sharing? Anthony, you started in the right place. And I can't wait till we get to this guy because I want to talk about something fun. <laughs> <laughs> we're getting there, I promise. I don't know which camera to look back at. But yeah, I promise we're getting there. I know. So I gotta look at the folks at home and tell them. I'm going to underline what Anthony said. We have unparalleled intellectual capital. I think you just got a sampling of it. And it's available in client publications that could be emailed at any time. And if the client chooses to, you can have them emailed regularly as they become available. First, I mentioned it previously, our house view publication, as well as our guide to executing on what the house view is, simply said, what does UBS think? What should I do about it? Always a question on clients' minds. Additionally, our CIO market alerts, since published every time you've been busy, every time the market's up or down 2%, <laughs> which has been a lot, uh, that's really timely. That's David writes a note. Exactly. He writes a I note. I love it. I look yeah. forward to yes. it. Yes. I feel like you're writing directly to me. <laughs> a personal letter yes. to Bill Carroll. <laughs> and important to keep in mind is we also leverage the intellectual capital of our great external partners. A um, great example of this is something I'm looking forward to that you should all try to tune in for. Next Tuesday, May 24th at 4 p.m. Eastern Time, our president of UBS US and co-president of Global Wealth Management, and by the way, a big hockey guy himself, all five of his kids played, Tom Narital, along with Mark Rowan, CEO of Apollo Global, will discuss the shifting market environment, the rising appeal of alternatives, which I mentioned briefly before, mm -hmm. as well as their expectations for the months and quite frankly, the years ahead. This is an absolute don't miss. I would add it to your calendar. Um, those of you watching, your FA can send you the link for it. I really think it's something that will be valuable. So to summarize, subscribe to the great publications we have, The House View, Washington Weekly, which keeps you apprised of what's going on in Washington. Mm -hmm. Tremendous piece. No other firm provides a perspective like we do about the geopolitical and U.S. political environment. A lot of great information out there, and your FA is happy to share it. Yeah, and with the midterm elections coming up, we have Election Watch yet again, uh, led by John Savicool in Public Policy, Tom McLaughlin from CIO, Selena Marcelli. It's a great, great piece. Thank you, Bill. All right, all right, all right. So let's do it. Let's, let's have a little fun, as Bill said. Let's talk hockey. So Neil, Neil Smith is here in the studios. I want to just, first of all, highlight, I mean, you've had an incredible career in the NHL. And Bill, jump in, because I know you and Neil also are, are great friends here. I, I mean, you were a scout, you played for, you know, you played for, you came out of Michigan. I mean, you, you were drafted by the Islanders when you began your career. And then, of course, you became the GM, the general manager of the New York Rangers in 1991, 89, 89. And, of course, we all know, anybody out there knows that in 1994, it was one of the greatest days for any Rangers fan. I remember weeping, Neil, I kid you not, I remember weeping with friends in a bar, watching them hold the cup, and we were crying and screaming and cheering you. It's one of those you remember where you, you are. You always next. do, yep. I was in uh, P&G's, it's a bar up in New Paltz where I went to college, <laughs> and we were having the best day of, 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 uh, of, my, of my, uh, my college life. So let me ask you, what are you thinking of the playoffs so far? We're in round two. Round one was... 
I mean, it was really exciting. There were some surprises and there were some upsets, but how do you, what, how do you feel so far about how it's going? Well, <clears throat> what I like as a hockey guy is that the, the, I could predict what was happening as the series was going on. Uh, some years you get a complete shocker of, a, of a, let's say, an eighth seed that beats a first seed, and, and you're like, well, how did that happen? Uh, you, you can't figure it out other than bad luck, bad timing, bad goaltending usually. Uh, but in this year's series, the, the, the teams that won – I think should have won, like Tampa Bay beating Toronto. That was a could be said as an uh, um, upset because it was the third seed beat the second seed, but um, it really wasn't because Tampa's won the cup the last two years in a row. Um, so I, I think that it's great playoffs. I think that you've got the eight best teams in the league still playing. You, you're not missing one of the eight best. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think I'm looking forward to how it's going to pan out after this round. Yeah, it was a tough. It was a tough loss last night for uh, for Rangers fans. Um, but uh, you know, listen, it, it's it's only it was only game one. Game two is tonight, so I'm really looking forward to watching that. Anthony, I got a fun fact for you. Please, I, I love I would love to hear that. He told me this the other day. Gerard Gallant, the current coach of the Rangers, he drafted him as a player when he was with the Red Wings. Yeah. I gave him his first contract, actually. That's amazing. Yeah, so I'm still very good friends. Are you talking to him? Are you calling him? Are you so, giving him oh, advice? Yeah. We're getting no, tickets no here, advice. Anthony. <laughs> We're getting some tickets. Come on. Well, when, when are they coming well, back? They're, they're, they're away now, but when they come uh, home, let's go to the garden. Well, I'm going to get Jerry to call you on your birthday. <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing to add, but I will, I will certainly enjoy the phone call. <laughs> Um, you know, and of course, uh, you, we've got this beautiful UBS Arena image behind us, um, which just opened in November. Bill, we're going to talk about that with you in a second. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous uh, sports venue, concert venue. Uh, I've been there. I haven't been there yet with you, Neil, but next season when the Islanders are playing home, I definitely want to catch a game with you because that might be one of the, the uh, probably a great experience. Um, but there was a little bit of a shakeup with coaching and management with the Islanders. Um, Trotz is out. Lane Lambert was named. You think, what do you think about the moves that the Islanders is making for their next season coming up? Yeah, well, it was a disappointing year for sure for the Islanders. They started 13 games on the road. They came out of that okay, just under 500. They came home and got hit with COVID really badly. Uh, we're missing a lot of the, their players for a big home stand that they had, and they didn't fare well during that. So now you're in a hole in a 32-team league. It's hard to dig out of those holes mm -hmm. when you start that way in the season. I think that basically happened to the Islanders. So they were disappointed. Now, Lou Lamorello has had Barry Trotz for four years working with him day to day. Knows him really well. Knows what a quality coach he is, and he is. He's one of the best in the league. However, obviously, his voice wasn't being heard by the players, according to Lou, and he needed a new voice. The Lane Lambert um, hiring is really interesting. Never been a head coach in the NHL. However, if you look at his resume of how many years he's been an assistant and where he's been and who he's learned under... You know, you can't be a head coach until somebody gives you the job as head coach. Mm -hmm. So it's not fair to say, why would you hire him? He's never been a head coach. Somebody has to hire you the first time. And so um, Lane's been around a long time. It will be a new voice. It's a younger voice. Um, and we'll, we'll see what happens. And I mean, he's, he's Trotz's longtime assistant, so he's yep. been there, uh, you know, on the ice with him all along. So he knows the moves that he made and probably the ones that he would do differently. Absolutely, and he knows what worked and what didn't work, and he knows the players. The biggest thing is he, he knows Barzell's personality. He knows all these different personalities, and I pick Barzell because I think he's the best player, but he knows all the personalities of the players. He knows what buttons to push, and so it's going to be really interesting. I yeah. have history with him as well. What's the history? Can you share it with us on sure, live TV? Well, in 1980. <laughs> 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 In 1983, I was with the Red Wings, and we drafted Steve Eiserman in the first round. And in the second round, we drafted Lane Lambert. Amazing. Second round pick. So, uh, and he played for three years for the Red Wings. People don't remember that. He played uh, very early um, in that uh, transition of the Red Wings being down at the bottom of the barrel to coming up to the top. It's awesome. It's incredible. Um, I, I also want to let our viewers know, um, and this is courtesy of Bill Carroll. Uh, we're going to ask a trivia, two trivia questions a little bit later in the show, one on hockey and one on the markets. And the first person to answer the question correctly via email uh, will receive four tickets to the Islanders home opener at UBS Arena. So very generous of you to have those tickets. So four and four. So there's four for question one and four for question two. So we're going to get to those a little bit later. Um, I, maybe we should go to some, uh, some questions from... The audience, let me see, what do we have coming in here? Um, Nicole from Baltimore wants to know, if you don't currently have an account with UBS but you want to find the right advisor, how do you go about that? Bill, that question's probably best for you. 
Sure. Um, Anthony, the best thing that anyone could do, certainly, is go onto our website, uh, UBS.com, and there's a location bar. Put in your zip code. It'll tell you where the nearest UBS office is. And what I would do is contact the local manager. He or she would be happy to have a conversation with you, find out what's important to you and your family, what are your goals, what are you trying to achieve. And then through their expertise, they'll match you with the right FA or team of FAs. And what we often suggest is meet with one or two or three different people. They're all very competent and qualified, but sometimes it's a personality fit. Who do you feel good with? Who do you want to do business with? So love to see anyone do that. We will definitely put them in the hands of a, a really well accomplished advisor who's looking forward to helping them. Awesome. Thank you, Bill. Uh, let's see. We've got another question. Neil, what would you do if you were, let me see. No, let me see. Here we, I, actually, this is another one. Ah, let's skip to the next one. It, this is for Neil. Top prospects for next season. Who do you see coming up? Well, the entry draft is coming up uh, like it does every summer. Mm -hmm. The entry draft of 22 is going to be interesting. There's not a, a generational player uh, in this draft like there is some years. For example, there's no Sidney Crosby. Um, you know, there's no Mario Lemieux. There's no franchise players, but there are certainly stars. Uh, Shane Wright is an 18-year-old kid out of Kingston, Ontario, uh, plays for the Kingston Frontenacs at, uh, in the OHL, um, is the number one pick, uh, consensus by almost everybody that he's uh, going to be the best player. An interesting fact about this draft um, is that uh, you go back to the Lane Lambert angle, this is, this is amazing. There is a kid that's playing in Finland who has a Canadian father, a Finnish mother, he was born in Finland, and his name is Brad Lambert. Brad Lambert is the nephew of Lane Lambert. There it is. That's, and, and he's slated in the draft to be picked mid-first round. Islanders are picking 13th. You never know. He may wow. end up in his, his, and his uncle's, and his team. uncle's team. Yeah. That, would be, that would be incredible to the watch. The other one that's amazing is there's a kid at Northeastern University, uh, Jack Hughes, the same name as the devil, uh, but his father happens to be Kent Hughes, who's the general manager of Montreal Canadiens. Now, Montreal picks first in the draft, so that would be a really uh, <laughs> something special if his dad made him first right. overall. That's not going to happen. But uh, There's that know, whole nepotism angle. Can you, you know, imagine, that? and you know better than any of us, in a city like Montreal, the pressure on both of them oh. if he picked him first? Uh, well, he'd have to pick, yeah. Maybe he'll get him in the second round. Right. <laughs> yeah, Neil, that's a, that's, you know, that's a really good question. But who are the, you know, you've, you've played, uh, you know, with, you've traveled with all the teams. Who are the most avid, insane fans in the stands when you go watch games at home? Oh, I, I think, uh, well, they're all East Coast, I can tell you that for sure. It's, it's either New York, where I was lucky to be a part of, or um, the Philadelphia fans are, are tough, mm -hmm. and the Boston fans can be tough. Um, Montreal is like being in a, um, if you're a player or a coach or a manager, you're in under the microscope every single day. Mark Bergevin was the GM before Kent Hughes, friend of mine. He told me that he went out to dinner with his sister when he first got the job, and there was pictures all over the place that he was out with some woman. And oh, it was his own sister. His sister. Yeah. So that's how it is in Montreal. <laughs> He's so, got to like have her wear a sign on her back. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Like, so so it's, that's how crazy Montreal that's, that's is. Wild. The scrutiny is crazy. Oh, my gosh. Um, we'll take. We have time for one more. And David, this. And by the way, this is not a question that you you uh, have not been asked by me many times as we sat and done CIO live. What's your go-to elevator pitch these days? Meaning, you know, you've got about thirty seconds to a minute to right. say, "Here's what's going on." What are you telling people in that time frame? So, look, I, I think I think the main question that investors are facing now, Anthony, is is will there be a recession, or will will we avoid a recession? Have the soft landing again? We. We do think that that we're we're going to avoid a recession, and and the the economy is going to end up being okay. But I also think, look, it's it's con it's worth considering the downside. We've I think it's important to bear in mind we've already felt a lot of pain. Yeah, right? we're down certainly about twenty percent uh, on the broad markets. Growth stocks have done even worse. I'm going longer than the elevator pitch, I guess. But, 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 <laughs> the doors but, have opened. Maybe you're going back the, up again. But the, maybe the elevator is like 100 stories. Yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but it's I, a but, tall building. Yeah. The, the main thing I want to say is, look, I, I think the downside from, realistically, the downside from here is probably less than the downside we've already experienced. Mm -hmm. In other words, if we have a recession, 
yeah, stocks will go down further. But it's probably only about 10 or 15% more. If we avoid the recession, stocks are definitely going to do very well from here. So I, I, think, I think it's important to keep perspective on the long term, uh, as Bill was talking about. And you know, I, I think it's a great line. It's, it's time in the market, not timing the market. That's right. Um, and you know, it, it, there's no free lunch in the equity market. You know, this is the cost of the, the good returns you get in stocks is you have to live through experiences like this. But if you do, the rewards can be, can be quite good. So I, I would say sit tight but there very well could be some more volatility. Let me ask a quick question. Um, we'll, we'll go back to Q&A. There's more questions coming in from the audience. So thank you all for being so, uh, so participatory tonight. And don't forget, those trivia questions are coming up in, uh, I don't know, we'll say what, 20 minutes, Bill? How's that sound? Sure. We'll do the trivia question. Okay. Um, this, and this, this could be a one-word answer, but I hope it's not. Okay. What's worse right now, a recession in 2022 or continued inflation? Because clearly we know what the Fed's mandate is, but we know what everybody's, they're afraid of the big right. R word. What's, what are, what's your answer can, to that question? Can I choose all the above? Sure you can. I, I mean, You're, it's I, your stage right, now, David. Yeah, stage. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he wants to phone a friend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where's yeah. Regis Philbin when you need him? Look, I mean, inflation's bad. You know, it's not good, right? Mm -hmm. It erodes the value of our savings. It's going to lead to much higher interest rates if it, if it persists. Uh, it's going to make the cost of living is going to continue to go up. It, it's, it's, the Fed needs to get this under control. Now, it, it, is, do we have to take some short-term pain in the form of a recession to do so? I, you know, it's, it's, it's possible. Um, but that, what the Fed is trying to do is to, is to land this economy, slow down the economy just enough that it leads to a reduction in inflation, but it doesn't tip us into recession. So, mm -hmm. But I think either way, um, you know, ultimately th things will end up working out. But yeah, look, I, I think, I think the, be the best outcome is really that soft landing outcome. But we, you know, we, we, and I would say probably the recession is probably the better outcome. That way we'll kill the inflation mm -hmm. and we won't have to worry about this so much. Because it doesn't necessarily have to be a recession like we experienced in 08 and 09. I mean, it's not right. like, you know, but that was as a significantly, uh, you know, yeah. deeper than what we could experience. Yes. No, I, I think that's a great point, Anthony, mm -hmm. because I think there are, the situation today is very different than the financial crisis, right? Mm -hmm. We had over leveraged consumers, we had an over leveraged financial system, and then it, it was an unsustainable situation, and, and we saw what happened with that. I mean, today, consumers are in good shape, lots of savings uh, on their balance sheets, uh, as they were talking, you know, jobs are plentiful, and we don't see big pockets of overinvestment in the economy, so there's less that needs to be unwound. There's a lot of cash on the sidelines, there's isn't there? There's a lot of cash on the sidelines, but also there, there's less sort of bad investment decisions that were made, mm -hmm. right? I mean, people aren't out there buying homes that they can't afford mm -hmm. with mortgages that they're never gonna be able to be repaid. So I think the situation is very different. So I think if we had a recession, it would be, it would be a, a mild recession because we don't see those big imbalances in the economy. So yeah, recession, you know, they happen. Yeah. It's not, it shouldn't be that bad. Right, did, thanks did, David. Could you follow on that? Actually, I was had a, in a client meeting yesterday and the client right. asked me, boy, this client said to me, boy, this feels like, you know, 2007, 2008. And I tried as best I could, certainly not as well as you will articul articulate it. It's nowhere near that. Right. We don't have, you know, substantial amounts of debt. The consumer isn't leveraged to the same point, et cetera. Right. Can, can you give some other kind of parallels how it's not the same? Yeah. I mean, I think the consumer is the, is the key part of it. Um, if, you look at, if you look at interest payment, we look at something called interest payments as a percent of disposable income, right? So how, how much debt can consumers afford, on, afford to pay? We're, we're basically at 40-year lows on that measure, right? So consumers have a very easy job paying their debts at, the, at this time. It was, a, it was a complete opposite situation when we were looking in you know, 2007, 2008, when consumers were leveraged to the hilt and we saw what happened with that. So that's very different. And I think the safety and soundness of the financial system is completely different, right? We've got the Fed stress test that they do every year. It's a, it's a totally different situation in terms of the health of the banking system. So a repeat of 07, 08, 09 is, it, 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 I don't see how it even happened. I mean, it's just not possible given the set of circumstances that we're, we're looking at, you know, given what we see today. Very helpful, thank you. Yeah, good question, thank you, Bill. And let me stay with you, Bill. What, and since you work with and directly with our advisors every single day, what, what right now are the best advisors at UBS doing to get their clients through all of this volatility? I mean, clearly you're in client meetings, you're getting questions as well, but what do you see the best FAs doing? You know, I'll tell you, when you think about, now you have such a privilege to be in these meetings and observe what great FAs are doing, but when you see what they're doing, 
the number one thing is maintaining constant communication. Mm -hmm. This is not a time for clients to go it alone. Mm -hmm. Really key, isn't it? So key. When, yeah. you have, when you have a trusted advisor that you can lean on, I mentioned this earlier, it removes the emotional reactions to it. It allows people to lean on someone for advice. And we are in, make no mistake about it, the advice business. That is what people pay us for, and that's what we do really well. I mentioned our 150-year legacy of it. One of the tremendous advantages we have, Anthony, is not only the good advice we give people, but the advice that we've learned over 150 years of what not to do. Sometimes what not to do during a volatile period is just mm -hmm. as important what to do. So we have the perspective, we have the st historical perspective, we have the current perspective of things that clients in similar situations have done well, and things that people may be you know, headed in a direction that we'd like to help our clients avoid. Number one thing is that communication. The second thing which is so important is making sure you have a financial plan. This is not a time to just be, well, I don't know, let me kind of wing it. F financial planning, referring to the document, the plan that you did already, or if in a case, let's say for some reason you haven't done one, do one now. Mm -hmm. It becomes a living document that you can revisit, you can stay anchored to, and again, helps remove the emotional reactions. When you have your eyes set on a long-term horizon, these really become just bumps on the road to achieving your plan. Thanks, Bill. Um, it, yeah, our good friend Brian Hull, who we all know, um, always BBS says- BBS Arena is the house that be Hull built. It, it, <laughs> it, it is, and he beams like a kid when he stands in front of that, that building. But he always says we're in the relationship business. And that's exactly, you said we're in the advice business, we're in the relationship business, it's exactly right. You know, advisors have those great relationships with their, with their clients, they become friends with them and they, you know, and they, they, they help them through all kinds of things that don't necessarily have to do with, you know, what you're, uh, you And know. you brought up B. Hull. The follow up to that is yes. one of the greatest quotes ever in the industry. Oh, please. Brian Hull says, if relationships are not personal, they're not sustainable. Mm. Very so, good. Very great. Glad that you brought up relationships. Yeah. yeah, yeah, very cool. And Brian Hall is one of our vice chairs. He's held many, many important roles, but we love him at UBS. Um, Neil, the, this, this question I have to ask you, as a, fa as a fan, and especially a fan in 94, you, you made a lot of moves leading up to that Stanley Cup victory. What do you think, if there was one that you could pick, or maybe there's more than one, what was the move that really got you there in 94? I mean, you had you know, a couple of years to get the team ready. What was the thing that you know you did that said, this is going to win us the Cup? Well, that's easy. It was done in 1991. I traded for Messier, and that, that got us to stand <laughs> I was up. expecting that to be your answer. No, so. that, that, is, that really, truly is the answer. Um, the rest of it is, is just putting parts together um, uh, around that. Messier and, and Leach and Graves and Richter were the, were the core of the team, and uh, you, you just have to find the right pieces to go around to support that core. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's... it's we were lucky to get Mark, uh, meaning that he became available at that time, and, and uh, we had ownership that let me do it, and, you know, you see what happened. Right. That, that, the clip that we just showed, it still gives me chills. I feel like that, that college kid watching that. Right? That, it that, it that brings that me to tears. Jump. That yeah, messy. yeah it's, it's, oh, it's everything. Yeah. It's everything. Wait, no, so you have actually a little bit of history with... Hockey, Bill. Uh, yes, I'm a little more than I guess. In, all right, all right. Uh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Inquiring minds want to know. Like, share. Do let's share. So let's share. I've, nobody's nobody's. I've gotten attention. over the fact that when I graduated college, having played hockey in college in 1984, Neil did not draft me. So <laughs> I have, I have he still cries about it. I have yeah. forgiven him at yeah. the moment for that, but I will bring it up when I need to. But yeah, I had the opportunity to play all my life. I played in college, and I was a high school coach for 10 years. At one of the leading high schools on the East Coast, so that was a wonderful experience. And you know, coaching, as Neil will tell you, it teaches you great lessons of leadership, of how to manage and collaborate and get along with people. And you know, hockey has been key to my life, my entire life. So it's yeah, it's, it's a great privilege now to be part of this amazing facility that I'm so proud to have our name on. It really is. Anybody who's in the area visiting, you got to go catch a concert or a game or anything at the arena. It's be, it's beautiful. And there's so many interesting statistics. It's the most, it's the scoreboard. It's the most, uh, it's the, the largest scoreboard on the East Coast. It's got the most tech, it, the most, you know, brilliant use of technology, the way it's completely around. I mean, it's, it's, you know, there's no edges to it. It's an absolutely stunning scoreboard that they have hanging up there. Amazing. In the middle of that arena. It's, it's, it's incredible. Um, let's, let's, let's go to the, there's more questions coming in, so let's 
Let's see. Um, Mark, oh, you know what, David? This is a good question, mm -hmm. and I'm sure a lot of people are wondering this too. When do you see the 401 K accounts recovering, will they ever recover? I mean, you know, it's it's sometimes 401ks are a set it and forget it for a lot of folks, and then they look at it, you know, a year and a half later, they go, oh my God, what happened since the last time I looked at my statement? But what what do you what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I assume that this. I assume Mark is is asking about uh, the equity. Allocation I mean, I imagine 401k, so, right? But, yeah. Um, Probably yeah, have look, a couple look, of Vanguard we, funds in there or something, you know. So if we have that soft landing that I was talking about, mm -hmm. and we, we avoid the recession, I think we could easily see 10 to 15 percent upside in in markets. Um, and then, look, I, I mean, taking the longer term perspective here, Anthony, you know, I think this is not this is still a decent time to get involved in the equity market. I, I think over the next 10 years. We can, you can generate six, seven, eight percent type of returns annually over the, the next 10 years. So I, I think it's important to keep perspective on that long term. So yeah, look, I definitely think ultimately 401ks will recover. The, will the, if they recover this year, it's going to hinge on whether we have the recession or not. Again, we think we, think we don't have the recession. Uh, so that'll get much closer to getting back to those, to those all-time highs. But then over time, yeah, certainly they'll compound and, and grow and, and, and certainly will exceed all the, the levels that we, we, we saw previously. Great. Thanks, David. And especially if you've still got 20 years left to work, don't look at your 401k every day or reallocate it. Talk to a financial advisor who can help you do that. All right. Uh, Bill, that's a good question. I, I'm, I can't wait to hear your answer. What is a night like at the arena? And share what the experience for a game or concert is like for our clients for fans, for the advisors? I love that question. I'm yeah. so proud to talk about this place. I don't think I've ever been prouder to work for UBS than when this arena opened last November and I had the privilege of being there. You know, if you think about New York, it is the sports, entertainment, and financial capital of the world. Right. And it's not very often you get a chance to have your name so prominently on a building. If you've flown into JFK or LaGuardia recently, you see it lit up at night, the big letters, UBS, the keys. See it right there, look at that. There you go. It's all lit up in neon um, on the screen. It's just an, it's incredible. Amazing, it's an amazing thing. And to work with partners like the New York Islanders, by the way. There it is, all right. I'm, I'm supporting. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Even though he's a Rangers fan. I, I'm a fan of both. I know, as am I. Exactly. But to, and I really, the Islander organization's been amazing with mm -hmm. us. But also partner with OVG Group, who built and manages the arena. I mean, the construction of this facility, and we're so proud of this as an organization, provided 1,500 jobs it's in incredible. the community. And it also created another 1,500 permanent jobs. And if you think about the operation of this arena, and I mean, if anyone's been watching tonight who's been there, you're incredibly impressed with the venue. It sits on the grounds of Belmont Park, which you could argue is behind Churchill Downs, the second most famous horse track in the world. And the attention to detail, the way it was thought about environmentally, how it was built in such a friendly way and constructed and operates with the respect and history of the area, it's just incredible. Mm -hmm. Clients who have visited an Islander game, a concert, Monster Jam, which I know you've been at, David. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, he's got tickets for Smashing Pumpkins in, in the fall. Yeah, exactly. And Jane's Addiction. Yes. That's, and a, that's a double And bill. what's been wonderful is we've been able to reward our terrific employees with some opportunities to visit the arena as well. It is a really great fan experience. You have an incredible sense of pride when you're there. We love everything they've done and the sensitivity, again, to the environment and the community. I have to ask you, you've been in like every NHL arena, which are also you know, the same arenas for concerts, mm -hmm. basketball, around the country. How would you compare it to the ones you've been in? That's a great question because I, I've, you know, there's, there is a couple now that I haven't seen. But I can tell you that when you told me that uh, UBS had the naming rights to the New Islanders Arena and it was going to be in Belmont Park, it was only in my imagination that I could try to figure out what was the building going to be like, where was it, you know, and, and your imagination often isn't what, the tr what it becomes. Mm -hmm. And I got to tell you, I, was, I still am blown away by this building. Um, it's the best building I've ever been in in my entire hockey life. I've never been in a building that is this beautiful. I tell my friends that you, it's like going into a five-star hotel 
being in the lobby for a while, then you pull back a curtain to go into your suite, and there's a hockey game going on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's wild, it's, isn't it? It's just it? crazy. It's, it's awesome. It, it is just, it is awesome. But I've also gone through the, the fan experience there and seen the store that they have, seen the lobbies that they have, the concessions that they have, mm -hmm. uh, the way you get in and out of the building, the detail that's on the outside of the building. Um, it, it, it's, it's phenomenal, but I think more than anything else, Bill, I agree with with you, the name rights that we have is so prominent. It's amazing. I, I could never picture how cool this would be to have UBS that big on the side of this beautiful building and on the top of it and on the Islanders' helmets and on the ice and on mm -hmm. the boards. For a company that I thought never advertised before I worked for UBS, man, oh man, we got a lot of exposure now with this building mm -hmm. and, and, and quality exposure. Last thing is, you walk into the building, you go to get in the elevator, in white on a black carpet, it says UBS Arena, and that carpet is pristine every night. There's no footprints on it, there's no dirt on it, it's pristine, and just like a five-star hotel, yeah. it would be. And that's, that's what UBS Arena is. Yeah, it's, it's such pride. Can I ask you, Anthony, do you happen in the studio to have sunglasses? Because those two were blinding. Yeah, yeah. Can we can we can we zoom in on those? Take a look at these. Those championship rings that Neil is sporting right now, Matt. Can you can you zoom in on that? I mean, because that is okay. Here we go. It's gonna. He's gonna zoom. The, so wait, Neil. Tell us again. How many other people have? Well, th this one here is the Rangers 1994 ring, and this one here is 1982 Islanders ring. Again, just like Bill, I was lucky. I got into the business when I was 12 years old, <laughs> but. Uh, <Yeah. laughs> Uh, but uh, there is only one other human being that has both a Ranger Stanley Cup ring and an Islander Stanley Cup ring. One other person, and he played for the Islanders and played for the 94 Rangers. And this is not the trivia question, although it could have no, been. No, this could have been, but yeah. this would have been, been too hard. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the man is Greg Gilbert, who Amazing. Played, was a rookie. Ah, Amazing. Yeah. You traded for him in 94, right? Yes, yeah, we, we got him in, in right that season. Great guy, great guy, and turned into a great coach down the road, too. Wore number 17 on Number 17, and um, I remember hugging him on the ice when we won the Stanley Cup, and, and I said to him, can you believe we did it for these guys? Meaning, because we were both original Islanders, and now we'd gone in and won it for, for the, the Rangers. <laughs> <laughs> and I did say that to him on the ice. I was holding him, going like, because you're so ecstatic at that moment. Um, that, that yeah. must have been one of the best moments of your, well, it, it, yeah, your it's, professional career. Yeah, it goes by too quickly, i got to tell sure. you. It's gone so fast, you, and you want to be back doing it again. That's why there's, you know, sports are what they are. You want to you win it again. You want to feel that one more time. Yes, we do. Hey, we want the Islanders to take it all the way next year, so especially right there at a home game. Um, Neil, let me stay with you. Tina Z is asking... I, this is a really interesting question. The future of the game, specifically style and play, how you might actually see it in the, in the future. Well, I think that, you know, we talk a lot about this because I'm from another era. Uh, the 90s game wasn't the same as it is today. The game's developed because of science and, and um, everything gets better over time. Uh, hockey has had to make adjustments. Um, there's not as much hitting in the game as there used to be because the players are so darn fast that if they hit like they hit in the 90s, I think they'd all be injured by the end of the game. Yeah. Um, and there's no, no fighting in the game, which you knew that had to go at some point. There's the odd fight, but not like it used to be. Uh, the players wear shields now. They have carbon sticks, not wood sticks anymore. Uh, their skates are sharper mm -hmm. than the skates used to be. They have the, to wear helmets. The padding, yeah, they have to wear helmets. <laughs> they have to wear mouth guards. Um, there's a lot more padding. I think the game's just going to continue to improve mm -hmm. and hopefully take on a bigger, bigger and bigger and bigger audience. It's a very tough game for TV because of the size of the puck as compared to a basketball or even a baseball or a football. Um, Got to put some LED lights on those things or something, yeah, yeah. you know, so people we're can follow it. We're trying all the time, though, to make it uh, more user-friendly. Um, but there's nothing like being at an NHL hockey game. Hands down. Being at the game. And there's no building to watch a game in like UBS Arena. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I love going to games. Um, going to get definitely get myself to the arena you a lot next season. You are the last guy in NHL history to not wear a helmet. That's right. As that's that's why I said that. That's that's I mean, now they yeah. have to. Yeah, Craig, no Mc, Craig McTavish. That's right. The last no one choice. Ever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So we're just about eleven minutes from the end. Let's do uh, let's do trivia. 
Sounds Good. great. Okay, so we have two questions. One is a, a hockey question. One is a markets <clears throat> question. And again, uh, whoever sends us the right, an the correct answer first into the email, and I'll give you that email address in one second, we'll get four tickets to an Islanders home opener at UBS Arena. So one, two batches of four tickets each. Okay, so here's the email, UBS Studios at UBS.com, or on the website, click the Ask a Question button. You can send it. Whoever sends it in first correctly is going to get these tickets. All right, here we go. First question we'll do is the market question. Here's the question for the audience. What was the closing level of the Dow Jones Industrial Average on the night or the day that the Rangers won the cup, which was June 14th, 1994. So what was the closing level of the Dow Jones the day that the Rangers won the cup? So that's the, that's the markets question. Again, send it into UBS Studios at UBS.com. The hockey-related question, and this is, this is Niels, who was the first coach of the New York Islanders in 1972? Mm -hmm. Neil, came, Neil, Neil gave us that question. First coach of the Islanders in 72. So whoever sends us those two answers first, we'll get those four tickets. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty cool prize. A home opener game at UBS Arena. Pretty cool. Um, all right, so we have a couple more questions from the audience. Let's keep going because they're still coming in. Um, Kurt K is asking David, what, and, and in quotes, if anything, can the Biden administration do to get things headed in the right direction? I'm assuming they're talking about the markets here, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I, I think you know, the main issue is, is this inflation issue. And there's, there's not much that government policy can do in, in the short term. I mean, you know, what, what could be helpful is some ways of expanding investment, expanding production. Uh, in the economy, that, that might be helpful. But you know, really, this is a job for the Fed. I mean, this is why we have a Federal Reserve. Uh, the Fed is, their mandate is stable prices and full employment. The good news is they're on the case. Um, it's just gonna take some time for, 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 for them to deploy the policies that are needed to get the inflation under control. So, um, you know, the other thing is, look, I, I think, you know, probably something on the energy side, right? I mean, we know, you know, no one's happy with the, the high gasoline prices. Um, if, but that's a tough nut to crack in the short term. I mean, you know, you can't snap your fingers and all of a sudden get more oil. So I, I think it really comes down to getting the inflation under control. Part of that is also the energy situation, uh, but it's, it's just going to take some time to, to resolve those issues. Great. Thank you, David. Uh, Neil, here's a, good quote. here's a good one for you. Stuart A. is asking, uh, what do you think of the core group in Pittsburgh? Uh, keep, <laughs> the way this was worded, keep the aging group together or is it time to make a change? And Pittsburgh's part of our division. So <laughs> Wait, yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah. Bill, be kind, be kind. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, the, the, I was surprised, to be honest with you, at how well Pittsburgh played yeah. this season. I thought they had a real good year. And I think that had things been a little bit luckier for them, for example, had DeSmith not gotten hurt in the first game, and remember, he, he is the actual backup to Jerry, and, uh, and uh, they had to put in their third string goalie to start the playoffs. And then Sydney got hurt during the playoffs, and then they put back for the seventh game, Jerry, who came back in for his first game after injury, um, it might have been a lot, you know, the Pittsburgh might have been able to overcome losing three games in a row like they did to the Rangers. I don't think as long as you've got Sidney Crosby and Malkin and Latang, um, you know, you're ever out of it. I, I think that they, they, they do have to start to get younger. Obviously, everybody does at some point, um, but they shouldn't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you, Neil. You have to let me answer that question. Where was I in 94? That, okay, where were you in 94? Thank, thank you for asking. Yeah, Bill, where were you in 94? <laughs> you talked about where you are. I I'll was, yes. This. <laughs> My son Ryan was born in June of 1993. Neil knows Ryan well. June of 1993. So I am watching Game 7 in Stanley Cup Finals holding my one-year-old son <laughs> on my lap. And as soon as they won the cup, I held him up. I swear I'm not making this up to be funny. And I said... You, I know you can't understand what's going on, but I need you to look at this because this may never happen again in your life. That's exactly where I was. That is a great story. Yeah. I thought you were going to say, I held him up and I said, Ryan, your name is now Stanley. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for sharing that, Bill. Um, okay, um, I think we have time for one more question from the audience, and then we're going to do a quick lightning round, and we only have five minutes left here. Um, uh, let's see, Matt H. No, no, we're scrolling through. 
All right. Well, you know what? Let's while we're waiting for another question to come in, let me do lightning round with you with you guys. And and David, let me ask you: um, biggest surprise you think could happen, positive or negative, for the remainder of the year? So we've had a lot of negative surprises. So I'm going to go with a positive surprise. Um, you know, whenever I, Anthony, whenever I speak to clients or uh, you know around the country, and and we talk about this perspective that we have that inflation is going to start improving, I get a lot of skepticism about that. So I, I think, but we, we've looked at the the data, we've looked at what the drivers of inflation have been, what the Fed is doing, and we feel pretty strongly that we are going to see a pretty meaningful improvement in the inflation story. And I think that is potentially going to be really crucial for for financial markets. So I would say. I would focus on the positive surprise that inflation really does end up being, uh, does end up coming down uh, certainly much, much, much better than it is today. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's going to lead to a, a lot of good things happening in financial markets. Terrific. Thank you, David. Bill, let me ask you a question. Best advice you can give to a client who's working with a UBS advisor today? Lightning round, so I'll give you a quick answer. Yes. I'm going to repeat a little bit. I okay, apologize. Fine, do it. Stay committed to your plan. Our planning process is known as Wealthway. It considers three parts of your financial life. Your liquidity, your longevity, and your legacy. If you break down your aspirations, your goals into those three buckets and have a great conversation with your advisor and stay committed to a plan, you will get through this. You will get through this because history tells us we always have. Mm -hmm. So don't react emotionally. Trust the advice of your wonderful advisor. Terrific, thank you, Bill. Uh, I'm not gonna let you off the hook, Mr. Smith. Um, Who's taking the cup this year? I know it's a big, it's a big prediction. You could give me top. No, no hedging. We no hedging. All right, we're gonna ask for the one. I, 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 I no, I'm, I'm ready. All right, go. Colorado. Really? Why? Yeah. Give us your conviction. I just think that they're they're that good, and they're they're a strong team. They're they're a playoff style team. Um, I I just I think they're the best team out there. I think that Florida is really good in the East, who won the President's Trophy. But they have, they don't have any playoff experience because they 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 got so good so quick, and um, I think Tampa is going to be a real sore spot for Florida in this series they're playing right now. Tampa may even knock them out. Um, you, you can never uh, count the champ out until he's down on the down on the mat, and, mm -hmm. and that's Tampa Bay. So, um, but I do believe at the end of the day, Colorado is going to be the team in the playoffs that can win. All right, there you have it. So we'll see who are the, who are they going to play. Oh, on this side, I think, uh, well, I'm going to have Ranger fans mad at me if I say Carolina. <laughs> mm. uh, that's who I thought before mm -hmm. they would end up Say playing, Rangers. I think you'd be safer to yeah, say Rangers. I, I say Rangers. Say Rangers. Rangers. Yeah. Rangers, yes, uh, yes. Yeah, Go Rangers. Islanders. <laughs> Islanders. <laughs> Next year. Next, Next year. year. Islanders all the way. We're going to be there at games to do it. Um, gentlemen, this has been uh, an extremely fun night. We've, we're, I can't believe an hour has already gone by, so thanks for joining. And Neil... Um, really excited to have you give us your your uh, your take on what's going on out there in the playoffs. David, Neil, Bill, good to see you. Bill, wrap it up. Anything you want to anything you want to add? I would just I would thank my colleagues and you certainly as well, my colleagues and friends for their time tonight. And most importantly, I just want to say thank you to all of you watching. The trust and confidence you place in your UBS advisor, we take that very seriously. We will do everything possible to help you achieve your financial goals. We appreciate and value your business. We know you have a lot of choices, and I just want to say how proud I am of our advisors as well. In a recent survey that was just released from J.D. Power, the UBS client is the most satisfied client among the four major wealth management firms. So I'm just so proud of the men and women that not only make up my division, but the 16,000 men and women that work in Wealth Management USA. And yes. I thank them, and I thank most of all our clients and our guests who joined us tonight. Yeah, and congratulations to all of you at the table, all four of us, but it's certainly, you know, with the amount of intellectual capital, David, that you and the Chief Investment Office are consistently putting out there, Bill named a bunch of resources that are out there for, for clients and advisors too, so thank you for what you're doing. And Neil, you're part of our Athletes and Entertainers client segment, so I know we're going to get you and the head of that segment, Wally Ogunleya, on for more sports-related conversations and certainly helping that particular segment with their financial lives, so thanks for what you do. And Bill, I mean, you know, it goes without saying. You are, you are so well-loved. Your advisors just absolutely adore you, as I, do, as I do. I've known you for a really long time. So it's a pleasure to be sitting here with all, four, all three of you tonight. I guess one of the smart things I did in my life was hiring you. Oh, uh, well, that's, I appreciate that, Bill. Mom, <laughs> see, I told you. 
<laughs> and listen, thank you all for joining us. Uh, I'm, 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 I, I hope you felt that we put together a really fun night and you got all these perspectives on what clients should be doing, this volatility that David's talking about, and the great advice from Bill on how you can be working with a financial advisor. And look, as we watch these exciting playoffs, we heard inside knowledge from the man right here who has been there and he has earned that Stanley Cup before. So it's very exciting, Neil, to have you here. And thank you to you guys again. And, and for those of you who are you know, checking out what we're doing here, make sure you're reaching out to your financial advisor and get to UBS Arena. Go catch a game, catch a concert, and also catch our daily show, UBS Trending, at UBS.com slash studios. From New York City, I'm Anthony Pastore. Good night, everybody.